Atheists and skeptics challenge theists to develop our own scientific model that can explain the evidence in light of scripture and that can withstand scrutiny. Creationists have done so. That's not to say that we have all the answers because scripture doesn't tell us everything we need to know to explain every shred of evidence ever gathered and scientific theories are inherently tentative. They, they may be found to be wrong upon gathering further evidence. But the same is the case with regard to evolutionary theories. Now, a fundamental distinction between the two, however, is that biblical creation is built upon two bedrock foundational truths that have been substantiated by the evidence. Number one, the God of the Bible exists. And number two, the Bible is his word to us. It's inspired. So we can be confident that the events described in Scripture actually happened. It's just a matter of sorting out the details that Scripture is silent about, details that we would need to know in order to explain the physical evidence around us in some cases. Now, the two most important events in history that must be considered when attempting to correctly understand the universe around us are, number one, the creation week as described in Genesis 1 and 2, and number two, the global flood of Genesis 6 through 9. I cover creation in a different session. In this session, let's look at the biblical and scientific evidences in favor of the flood. Now, believe it or not, the geology world, at least among Christian nations, once accepted that the biblical flood happened. But about 175 years ago or so, uniformitarianism took off and went to seed in the geology community. Today, few believe the flood happened. It's a theory for those kooky Bible believers who blindly believe in the Bible, even if they don't have evidence, and even in spite of the evidence in some cases. There's no evidence for the biblical flood, they say. Well, first of all, no Bible believer should have a blind faith. The Bible never encourages that mindset. We're to only draw conclusions that are warranted by the evidence. Only believe what you can prove. The biblical way of wording it, test all things, hold fast what is good. Does the, does the evidence actually support the biblical flood or not? Psalm 111 2 says, The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. The things that God has done, His works, are great. They're worthy of our study and thought. They tell us about God. And the flood was one of the greatest works that the Lord ever did. The Bible tells us only a few details about the flood. It occurred four to 6,000 years ago. It was global in its extent. It covered everything. The fountains of the deep were broken up and water came from above. The mountains rose and the valleys sank. It lasted essentially a year. That's about it. And that's not really a lot to work with. Now, when we look up from the pages of Scripture and begin looking at the earth, the physical evidence, and we begin to try to study this great ancient work of the Lord, a key event in the history of mankind, and starting to look for evidence of that event and trying to interpret the available evidence to reconcile the physical evidence that we gather from the earth with what we see in Scripture, we ask the question, what can we learn further about what happened in the flood? Does the evidence from geology fit with Scripture? Genesis 4.26, uh, the last verse of chapter 4 in Genesis, tells us that after Seth had Enosh, men began to call on the name of the Lord. Chapter 5 then gives us the lineage of Seth and Enosh, the generations of individuals who were calling on the name of the Lord. But things gradually changed over the next 1,600 years. The reason for the flood, given in the text, is that every intent, every intention, the ESV says, of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. The cause of that wicked state on the earth is given in verses 1 and 2 of the chapter. The sons of God, those good people who were calling on the name of the Lord, who were following God, began to notice physical beauty and prioritize that more in their marital decisions. The good people began marrying the daughters of men, the worldly people, based on their physical beauty rather than spiritual beauty. Let that be a warning, young people, about what qualities you should prioritize in your dating and marriage decisions. Well, 
God instructs Noah to build a boat, 300 by 50 by 30 cubits. According to scholars, that would translate to a football field and a half long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet tall. Noah's told to make the ark out of this unknown wood called gopher wood, make three levels in the ark, have rooms for the animals, cover the ark with pitch so that it doesn't leak, put a door in the side of the ark. God tells Noah to install an opening, not exactly a window, but according to the underlying Hebrew, an opening for light, possibly ventilation, that apparently went around the top of the vessel and was a cubit in height. According to Genesis 8.13, a covering or awning of some sort was put over the opening as well, which was left until the end of the torrential rains, and then Noah opened this window-like structure to see the state of things. God apparently brought or sent the animals that he wanted on the ark to Noah. Noah didn't have to go hunt these down. A male and female representative of each of the unclean kinds of animals. And according to chapter 7, seven representatives of the clean kinds of animal, probably seven individuals, not seven pairs. Again, these are representatives of kinds, not what we would think of today, species. Uh, animals from the earth, including birds and creeping things, which would have included various reptiles, insects, worms. Noah also uh, brings food for his family onto the ark and for the animals. And then after loading up, God himself shuts the door and the fireworks begin, so to speak. And that, of course, brings us right up to the flood. Some have argued that the flood just couldn't have been global. There's just not enough water on the earth, they say. They look at the earth today and they say, hey, I mean, the flood, if the flood happened, where's the, where did the water go? Is it in the sky? No, there's not enough water in the sky to cover the earth. If all of the water in the atmosphere was emptied onto the earth, it would only cover it to a depth of about one inch. Well, is it frozen in the ice caps? No, that wouldn't do it either. That only cover the earth to a depth of 230 feet. Is it within the crust? Well, that's a little more significant. There's an estimated six quintillion gallons of water in the Earth's crust today. Now, if all that water was pumped back onto the surface of the Earth, it'd be enough to cover the Earth with water 600 feet high, so two football fields into the sky, and that's just water hidden in the crust. But notice this is still pretty insignificant. This is less than 1,000 feet total when you consider the height of the great mountains today, many of which are over 25,000 feet high. So many of those who consider numbers like these and still want to believe in the Bible will often reject a worldwide flood and argue that the, that the biblical flood had to be a local catastrophe, not a global catastrophe. But as we'll see, that argument simply can't be sustained in light of Scripture or science. The evidence points to a global catastrophe. Well, let's start with the depiction of the flood, what modern creation scientists believe occurred during the first few hours of the flood. Modern creation science theorizes that much of the water in the flood came from the oceans and from below the earth, rather than from clouds above, which is what was once more the thinking. But keep in mind that it's also incorrect to think of the flood as only involving water. The flood was a major geologic event. The earth was essentially restructured. The phrase, the fountains of the great deep were broken up, is significant. The great deep referring to the depths of the ocean. We're talking about the breakup of the ocean floor. Proverbs 3.20 mentions this as well, stating that the depths were broken up. The flood was a major geologic event. And notice that the text here in Genesis 7.11 says, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. There was more than just one, and all of them were broken up. Again, this suggests the breakup of the ocean floor. The deep was broken up. The order of events mentioned in Genesis 7 is also noteworthy to creation scientists today. The fountains of the great deep were broken up, and then the text mentions the rain is having been uh, occurring. So what exactly initiated the chain of events? That's unclear. Did God miraculously directly initiate the eruption of the fountains of the great deep of the ocean? Did he use some external physical entity like a massive meteorite hitting the earth? There's a substantial amount of physical evidence that suggests that a lot 
of meteorites struck during what we understand to be the flood layers in the rock layers below us. Secular geologists tell us that there are roughly 200 craters on the earth that have been verified as being from meteorites. And when you convert the dates that they give for those craters to the biblical time frame, we find that 57% of the confirmed meteorite impacts throughout the, the earth's history struck during the single year of the flood. Another 23% of the confirmed meteorite impacts date to the period immediately following the flood, from the flood through the Ice Age and up to Abraham. 80% of all of the known meteorite impacts occurred during the flood and during the following few centuries as Earth was combing down from the flood. Regardless, creation geologists have tried to piece together what may have occurred after that point based on what we understand about geology today. Geologists have determined that the interior of the earth is comprised of a solid inner core, a liquid outer core, a mantle of predominantly solid rock, although the upper part has some plasticity, and then we have the crust upon which we live. Now looking at the surface, geologists have discovered that the surface of the earth is broken into plates that move around today on the order of centimeters per year, about as fast as your fingernails grow. So the earth is kind of like a big cracked egg and the earth is unique in that as far as we know. The earth is the only planet known to have these plates. Creation geologists believe that the cracking of the egg may have occurred at the beginning of the flood. Recent articles by various secular geologists suggest that plate tectonics may have been initiated by meteorite activity. The model that describes the motion of the plates and the effects of that motion is called plate tectonics. Most geologic activity on the earth occurs along the margins of these plates as they move. Earthquakes, volcanoes, mountain building. As these plates move relative to each other, different things happen. Some transform, sliding past one another. Some diverge, so they move apart and new material from the mantle comes up into the gap. And we see this at mid-ocean ridges, for example. Some converge, smashing into each other. Two continental plates converge, mountains form. And if a continental plate converges with an oceanic plate, the ocean plate subducts. The ocean plate goes under the continental plate, diving down towards the mantle. Volcanoes form as that happens. Now, mountain building is extremely slow today because the plates are moving so slowly. It would take eons at today's rates to form mountains. So if mountain forming is happening today at such slow rates, then how can creationists explain that evidence? How can that be harmonized with scripture? Well, let's think about plate tectonics and the movement of the plates that comprise the surface of the earth. From the movement of these plates, geologists are able to extrapolate backwards, reversing their current trajectory to get an idea of their location in the past. And you've probably heard of the supercontinent we call Pangaea, or the supercontinent that is thought to have preceded Pangaea, Rodinia. Plate tectonic theory is able to explain why when the trajectory of the continents is reversed, they converge and fit together like a big puzzle, Pangaea. Plate tectonic theory explains why there are matching rock layers and even mountain belts on different continents that are separated by oceans today, but which fit together when the supercontinent is put back together. The Appalachian Mountains of the eastern U.S. become the Caledonian Mountains of northern Europe. Plate tectonics explains why there are matching fossil distributions across these big puzzle pieces of the continents that are now separated and several other things. It has great explanatory power, but as usual, modern naturalistic theories are based on erroneous assumptions. In this case, uniformitarian thinking. The idea that whatever you see going on today in geology must be all that's always gone on. You need to interpret everything from the past in light of whatever you see today. Whatever rates of movement, for example, or erosion we see going on today, it must have always been in that same way in the past. Cataclysmic events, which we can't witness today, are assumed never to have occurred. If the continents are to mo moving apart today on the order of centimeters per year, well, they must have always moved that slowly. And therefore, it must have taken eons for the continents to fit together in the way on the screen. 
As was mentioned at the beginning of this session, the Bible can be known to be inspired based on the evidence. It's a true account of history. So that means the flood actually happened, which means that uniformitarianism is not right. The effects of global catastrophes in the past has to be considered if such events could have played a major role in plate movement. Uniformitarianism is not going to ex correctly explain the evidence. Well, using the actual evidence from modern geology and plate tectonics, but without the hidden assumption of uniformitarianism, creation geologists have developed our own theory, catastrophic plate tectonics, or CPT. A young earth creation geophysicist by the name of John Baumgardner laid the groundwork for this model when he developed a supercomputer program while at UCLA doing doctoral research in geophysics and space physics. The program, called Terra, helps to model the dynamics of the Earth's interior. Based upon the predictions of that program, other creation physicists and geologists joined him in developing CPT that describes what probably happened during the flood. Significantly paraphrasing the model, before the flood, the plates didn't exist, the continents were not separated. At the onset of the flood, the fountains of the great deep were broken up, Genesis 7:11. The plates broke apart. Keep in mind that the fountains of the deep there wouldn't necessarily be solely water, but could include magma coming up from beneath the earth, which would be likely when the plates break up. So according to CPT, something causes the breakup of the cold, dense ocean floor, breaking it in several places, including breaking the ocean plate away from the continental plates. According to computer simulations, when that break at the boundaries between the continental plates and the oceanic plates occurred, there would have been a phenomenon called thermal runaway subduction of the seafloor after that. So instead of the creeping rate at which the plates are moving today into the mantle at the beginning of the flood, the sea floor is moving rapidly and it's diving into the mantle quickly. In 1994, when CPT was being developed, creation scientists predicted that if, if that's true, the mantle would have essentially been overturned in the flood like a big conveyor belt, and therefore there should be evidence of colder material still in the mantle, because this only happened a few thousand years ago. There hasn't yet been enough time for all that sub subducted material to get recycled into the mantle and heated back up. See, if uniformitarian plate tectonics is true, then this process has always gone on extremely slowly. And so there would have been plenty of time for any of the material from the ocean floor to heat up and be recycled before it got too deep into the mantle. In other words, there shouldn't be enormous piles of cold ocean floor in the mantle, down at the base of the mantle. Well, sure enough, three years after the 1994 prediction, seismic images of the mantle's density structure verified the prediction, showing that there is evidence of enormous piles of cooler slabs of material in the mantle, specifically under subduction zones, apparently remnants of the pre-flood ocean crust that piled up on the mantle. So this rapid diving would have caused the plates to move rapidly on the order of meters per second, rather than the creeping rates that we see today of centimeters per year. In other words, the supercontinent would have begun to break up and move apart rapidly. That would have caused the rapid formation of mountains along subduction zones and convergence zones as materials piled up as plates were diving or slamming into each other. Now you picture a, a conveyor belt with the, the cold crust of the ocean floor diving in the, into the mantle and then hot mantle material coming up onto the ocean floor, replacing it uh, on the other side of the plate. The extra hot magma hitting the cold ocean water would have caused steam to jettison into the atmosphere. And that magma would have been coming up all along the divergent zones all over the earth, most of which are in the oceans. This would have caused intense rain around the globe as these geysers that stretched for hundreds of miles all over the earth erupted and pumped water high up into the atmosphere, which then came back down from the heavens onto the land. The added magma to the sea floor would have also displaced water from the seas up onto the land, carrying with it uh, ocean creatures and so forth.
that hot material replacing the colder moving material on the ocean floor, that hotter material would have been in an expanded state because it would have been less dense because it's hotter and there and it's going to be lighter. So essentially the the new ocean floor initially would have been floating higher in the mantle, pushing the sea floor up, creation physicists and geophysicists believe 3500 feet or more. As the sea floor was raised, water from the seas would have spilled onto the land again carrying many sea creatures with it explaining why there are so many marine animals across the continents, even in the middle of continents, far away from the coast and far away from, uh, from the oceans and even up on what are now high mountains. So water is coming in from the ocean as the sea level is rising in addition to the water coming down from these immense geysers. Tsunamis would have rocked the land due to the major tectonic activity going on under the ocean. So most of the water from the flood would have been coming from the oceans through these steam jets and from the sea level rising. Now, while all of that's going on, we also have to keep in mind the meteorite impacts that are occurring. So far, there are over 100 meteorite craters that have been found on, on land that correlate to the flood period. But 70% of the surface of the earth is in the ocean. So if we take what we know about the land today and extrapolate to the ocean areas, we'd have to add around 230 more meteorite impacts during the flood. So probably over 330 meteorites in all are smashing the earth during the year of the flood. Clearly meteorites are a significant part of the flood. Well, let's look a little closer at Psalm 104, six through nine. You covered it, the earth, with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. The mountains rose. The valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass so that they might not again cover the earth. Well, in light of verse 9, it seems clear that this passage is referring to the flood rather than the creation week. Otherwise, this passage was violated during the flood. But if this refers to the flood, then it makes perfect sense because this modern creation model of CPT says that the high mountains would have been formed during the flood when the plates were smashing into each other at all of these convergence and subduction zones across the earth. Due to the formation of the mountains in the flood, it is now impossible for there to be enough water to completely submerge the earth again, just like this passage indicates. A boundary has been set. By the mountains rising, the valley sinking, verse 8, this boundary was set for the water that it might not again cover the earth. Well, according to the text, the rain itself continued for 40 uninterrupted days and nights, but that wasn't the extent of the catastrophe. The waters apparently continued to rise for some time after that. According to CPT, that would be due to the fountains of the deep continuing to disperse lava and possibly water from beneath the earth, displacing the seas onto the land. Well, the rising waters eventually leveled out and apparently began to de de decrease on the 150th day, five months from the beginning of the flood. The water was 15 cubits, about 22 or 23 feet above the pre-flood mountains. Notice that during this catastrophic period, typical earth processes, seasons, day and night and so forth, are totally disrupted. After the flood, God promises in Genesis 8.22 that he's not going to allow that to happen on a global scale again. The disruption of the seasons, as well as day and night, also would be expected under this CPT model we've been looking at. The cloud cover from both water and aerosols from all the volcanic activity going on would have stopped day and night, blocking out sunlight, and with it, summer and much of the heat that we receive. Obviously, seed time and harvest would be stopped while the earth was covered with water. Now, let's return to the question that we asked at the beginning. How could the flood be global? How could there be enough water to cover the earth prevailing above the mountains over 20 feet? Well, with the CPT model I've laid out here, you might already see the answer to the questions here. Let's look at the science side, first of all. Remember that CPT theory would say that the water came primarily from the seas, both in the form of rain from these enormous geysers and in the form of the sea level being raised from magma and hotter ocean floors. 
Well, when we recall from Psalm 104 that the taller mountains are, are forming during the flood, and we recall from CPT that the mountains are forming as the plates are converging and subducting, well, we realize that the pre-flood world must have been much flatter. So notice it wouldn't have been nearly as hard to cover the land with water at that point before the flood because the tall mountains wouldn't have even been formed until later in the flood when the recession period had begun. So you have to picture a flatter earth when you think about the pre-flood world, one with a lower elevation. Covering the highest points on the earth by day 40 wouldn't require anywhere near the amount of water that it would require to do so today. Okay, so where did the water go after the flood? Well, first of all, as the ocean floor was raised during the flood and the intense geyser activities going on from the fountains of the deep, that activity would have dumped loads of sediment onto the continents, raising the level of the continents relative to pre-flood times. Plus, mountains would have formed at all the convergent and subducting plate boundaries pushing the land up in those areas even further. And so notice, without the water going anywhere, the continents would have been higher in elevation, making them stick up out of the water further than they would have in pre-flood times. But then you have to consider other implications of CPT. Recall that as the ocean floor is diving into the mantle, new material is coming up and replacing it, and that material is hotter, which means that it's less dense, which means it sits higher in the mantle, which would have raised the ocean floor, according to creation geologists, again, 3,500 feet or more. So this conveyor belt process would have abruptly slowed after the ocean floor was completely replaced with new material. And so the steam jets would have stopped. As that new material on the ocean floor cooled, it would become more dense again and sit lower in the mantle, effectively slowly beginning to lower the seafloor again. That would then allow much of the water covering the land to recede back to the ocean from where it came. So bottom line, there's no problem from science in explaining where the water from a global flood would have come from and then where it went afterwards. Other evidences of a global flood from science, starting at the Cambrian explosion, at the beginning of the Paleozoic layers, the point where creationists believe the flood started, you have worldwide sandstone beds that were laid down by some kind of major, catastrophic, worldwide, water-involving event. You can follow these layers across the U.S. and then jump over the ocean, and the same layers continue on into Europe. These aren't localized beds of sediment like you see in the higher layers of the geologic column in the Cenozoic after when we believe the flood stopped. These are worldwide beds that involve some kind of water event. They begin at the Cambrian explosion and then similar worldwide beds continue up in the geologic column to the point at which the flood is thought by many to end, just above the Mesozoic layers. And also sedimentary rock is the dominant rock type throughout those worldwide layers, just as we'd expect. Sedimentary rock being rock that is generally agreed to be rocks formed from water activity, usually. When we move from science now and start looking at the Bible, we find the Bible simply doesn't leave room for a local flood interpretation either. So very quickly notice, if it was a local flood, then why in the world would you build an ark over 100 years or so? Why not just leave the area? Why bring animals from all over the, all over the place if this was local? Bringing representatives of every living thing of all flesh, why do that if this is local? Since God actually brought the animals to Noah anyway, why not just send them out of the area instead? How would the, the ark be able to stay afloat for several months if this was, in fact, a local flood? How could the biblical terminology describing the water as covering the high mountains that are under the whole heaven, how could that be describing a local flood? How could water even get high enough locally to cover mountains if the flood wasn't greater in its extent? How could the biblically stated purpose of wiping man from the face of the whole earth, how could that be accomplished with a local flood? If the flood was local, then didn't God lie when he promised never to again destroy the earth with a flood in the way that he had done? Local floods happen all the time, but not global floods. Also, Peter used the universal destruction of the earth and the flood to describe what judgment day will be like. If the flood wasn't universal, then logically, judgment won't be either. 
Also, why would the seasons have been so severely affected if this was just a local flood? Apparently seed time, harvest, winter, summer, day and night stopped during the flood. That doesn't sound like the effects of a local flood to me. Why did the dove find no resting place for the sole of her foot when this dove was sent out? Genesis 8 and verse 9. The Bible simply doesn't leave room for a local flood interpretation. Either the Bible is correct that there was a global flood or not. And there's no reason to question the Bible's claim that there was a global flood scientifically. On the same day the waters began to decrease, the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat, and the waters continued to recede for another four months. During that period of recession, we know that the retreating flood waters would have catastrophically eroded many of Earth's canyons, though perhaps not all of them. Uh, Grand Canyon might have been uh, actually eroded later. After nine months, on the first day of the 10th month, Noah could see the tops of various mountains. After another 40 days, he sends out a raven and a dove and then waits another week and sends the dove out again. After it returned, he waited another week, sent the dove out, and the dove didn't return. He waited about another month and removed the covering from the ark, seeing that the surface of the earth was now dry. And after another almost two months, the earth had completely dried and they finally are able to leave the ark. The timeline as given in the text is based on the Jewish calendar, which reckons time based on a lunar year, 354 days total. So based on the text, about a year and 11 days passed. And when you convert that from the lunar to the solar calendar, we find that from beginning to end, Noah and the other passengers left the ark after one solar year, exactly 365 days. Noah and his family, eight people, exited the ark. And from those eight people, repopulated the entire earth. Genetically, we all have a portion of Noah and a portion of his wife in our blood, regardless of our ethnicity. Now, whether or not the wives of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth were also part of Noah's family, like sisters or cousins, that's uncertain. They could have been from other Sethite or Canite families. If so, the portion of our genes that can be traced solely back to Noah grows even more. But unless all eight survivors were in Noah's family, then it can't be said genetically that all of our blood came directly just from Noah and his wife. The passengers from the ark found a completely different earth from the one they experienced before the flood. Peter says that the world that then existed perished. And there's no doubt that that has a lot more meaning than we typically ascribe to it, perhaps. This chart gives the lifespans of the patriarchs as recorded in Genesis 5 and 11. Notice the approximate 900-year lifespan before the flood, with the exception of Enoch and Lamech. And then notice the gradual drop in lifespans after the flood. The Genesis 11 genealogies, which pick up after the flood, aren't quite as clear-cut as the Genesis 5 genealogies, but this seems to provide some interesting evidence for the fact that apparently something was significantly different about the earth immediately after the flood occurred, likely in an environmental change. Apparently, size, health, life longevity began to drop drastically, possibly in a proportional way to whatever was going on on the earth as it was gradually calming down and trying to recover from what happened in the flood. And as further evidence of the major change that apparently occurred, Genesis 9, 2, and 3 says that animals would begin to fear and dread humans, possibly indicating something different about the nature of animals by this point. And then in verse 3, apparently linked with that statement about the animals, we have the first mention of God authorizing a carnivorous diet for humans, which would certainly lead to animals fearing humans. Now again, whether or not some humans were already eating meat before this point is unclear, but it is clear that God at least authorizes it here. It's also unclear as to whether this is the point at which animals formally became carnivorous. This isn't necessarily demanded by the text. Another example of how different the world was after the flood, the ice age or ice surge or ice advance, depending on which creation scientist you talk to, we find a lot of evidence on the earth that a large portion of the earth was once covered with ice. In fact, 30% of the land surface as opposed to about 10% today. We can observe glacier movement today and see its effects. 
We can see from those observations, we, we can infer that the glaciers of the north used to extend down deeply into the northern hemisphere. We find parallel striations, scratches on rocks that extend over miles and miles of plains that are parallel to each other, these rocks, from rocks and boulders that are in glaciers that scratch these rocks under glaciers as the glaciers move, faceted rocks that are worn flat from glacier movement, till and moraines that pile up as these glaciers move. Secular geologists today believe there were multiple ice ages over the last few million years, they say, as many as 50. But there's many issues with the modern interpretation of the evidence for ice ages. No single theory has been advanced that is able to explain all the evidence. Why were all of the animal extinctions associated with ice age activity only after, why did it only occur after the last ice age? We have 167 entire genera of large mammals the ones over 100 pounds, that completely disappear from the earth. Why all of the disharmonious associations where you have warm area animals like hippos living amongst cold area animals like woolly mammoths and reindeer? Why is there evidence of wet deserts, areas that are deserts today but, what, but which went through a period of being wet in the past? And of course, the biggest issue the uniformitarians have there is no known mechanism to initiate a single ice age, much less multiple ice ages. How do you even get an ice age started from a secular perspective? Well, this is a place where once again, creation science has provided a solid answer to the problems of uniformitarian thinking with regard to the ice ages. In fact, an ice age would be predicted to follow the flood based on the CPT model I've laid out for you. It would have been a necessary effect. The flood would have triggered an ice age. Modern creation science theorizes that there weren't multiple ice ages. There was a single ice age, and we call it more of, a, of an ice advance, perhaps, rather than an ice age sometimes, because they think this was a gradual buildup that only lasted about 700 years with a peak at about the 500-year mark. So creation scientists would say that all of the evidence the secular meteorologists are using to argue for multiple ice ages over millions of years, it fits instead into a single major ice age that lasted only a few hundred years. Now, what would be needed to initiate an ice age? We might be tempted to think, well, you just need colder winters. That'll do it. But that actually would have the opposite effect because with coldness comes dryness, less moisture. And that gets at the root of why secular meteorologists can't figure out how these ice ages could even get started. Well, there's three basic ingredients that are needed for an ice age. You need cooler summers, you need more moisture, and you need a persistence of those two other elements. All three of these would have been effects of the flood of the Bible. According to CPT, the volcanic activity during and after the flood would have shot ash and aerosols into the atmosphere, blocking a lot of solar radiation, cooling the summers. That would have caused less melting during the summertime, and so the ice would have continued to advance annually each winter in waves instead of melting each summer. Eventually, this is going to cause, of course, more and more extinctions, especially towards the peak of the ice's advance when the animal habitats were being more threatened the pre-flood environment was also much more warm, we think, including the ocean. The volcanic activity during and after the flood would have also heated the oceans even more by several more degrees. The result? Much more evaporation of the seawater, leading to intense snowfall, especially away from the equator since sun rays would have been halted by, halted by the aerosols and ash. And then the third ingredient that we need? Persistence. We'd predict that the volcanic activity from catastrophic plate tectonics was continuing for some time after the flood. The oceans would have continued providing significantly elevated evaporation for possibly centuries until the earth finally calmed down and things started moving towards an equilibrium state, at which time the ice would have begun to retreat. Towards the end of the primary melting period, catastrophic melting would be predicted to occur with huge amounts of water forming lakes, even in areas that are now deserts, explaining evidence for past wet deserts. As the lakes grew from the melting, <clears throat> many of the natural dams holding the water in these makeshift lakes 
would have been predicted to breach, causing the rapid formation of canyons, a phenomenon acknowledged to occur today by secular geologists when dams breach. Secular geologists argue that the Lake Missoula flood was a flood from an ice age known to have occurred due to the failure of one of these kinds of natural dams that I'm talking about, causing immense destruction, including a 50-mile-long trench between one and six miles wide with walls up to 900 feet high carved out of solid rock. Geologists estimate that 10 cubic miles of basalt from the trench was eroded rapidly by the catastrophic flooding from Lake Missoula. Grand Canyon is believed by many creation scientists to have been formed in this manner during the ice advance period as well. Recall that according to CPT, during the flood, the Pacific Ocean plate is subducts beneath the North uh, beneath the North America on the west coast of the U.S., that would have created mountains along the west coast, possibly the Rocky Mountains, as the continental plate scraped the ocean floor and piled up sediment on the coast. The Colorado Plateau would have been raised during this period, and all of that sediment from those sources, and some sources hundreds of miles away, would have been responsible for the sediment layers we see in the Grand Canyon. So the strata of the Grand Canyon are thought to have formed during the flood. And then during the Ice Age period, when the ice was retreating from the continent, it is thought that, all, that at least three major lakes were left on the Colorado Plateau before the Colorado River existed. The lakes are thought to have breached like dominoes and rapidly carved the Grand Canyon, leaving the Colorado River as it is today. Well, the creationists' ice advance theory may or may not be true. Again, it's, it's a theory. But notice it has great explanatory power where modern uniformitarian models fail to explain the evidence. It explains why the huge number of animal extinctions only occurred once, because there was just one ice age. It explains the disharmonious associations of the animals, because mild winters and cool summers kept all the animals relatively mixed. The evidence for wet deserts is explained by glaciers. Animal dispersions from Asia to America across the Bering Strait is explained, since more water would have been in the form of ice in clouds, allowing access across the strait. Plus, ice bridges would have formed in various places. The rapid formation of post-flood canyons is explained. The thickness of the ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica is explained. And of course, the biggest plus is that we have a clear-cut trigger that would have initiated the ice, the ice advance uh, due to the flood. And while all of that's going on, we have humanity reproducing after the flood. Genesis 10 and 11 give genealogical information about those intervening centuries during what creation scientists understand to be the ice advance or ice age period. It helps us to see which line from Noah repopulated which areas of the world, but not much beyond that is known from scripture. Babel falls in that period, probably at the time of Peleg. It could have been as early as 100 years after the flood or a few decades later, according to the chapter 11 genealogies. This would likely fall during the period of the Ice Age, which might help explain humanity's reluctance to obey God and spread out beyond the Palestinian area, or why God chose to step in when he did to make sure that the spread happened before the conditions of the Ice Age prevented passage to certain remote areas. Regardless, while there may have been several human languages before the flood, all of them would have been wiped out in the flood except Noah's language. By the time of Babel, that is still the only language. And then language divisions are supernaturally created by God for the first time here after the flood. And the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth then spread out from the Middle East area. Notably, human fossils and archaeological artifacts don't appear in flood or pre-flood layers. They were apparently completely wiped out in the flood, possibly subducted. Human fossils and artifacts don't appear until after the flood. Archaeologists divide what they call early human history into three ages, the Stone Age, Bronze Age, and Iron Age, reflecting areas, uh, times in the past, rock layers where certain human artifacts start showing up. So the Stone Age would correlate to what we would call 
post-flood, pre-Abraham. The Bronze Age roughly would correspond to Abraham to David, and then the Iron Age from David to present time. So we would correlate the Stone Age, especially with the dispersion after Babel and the Ice Age. Archaeologists looking at the artifacts that have been dug up in those early post-flood sediment see evidence that humans were nomadic during that time. They call them hunter-gatherers or moving from place to place. They believe they were doing that for thousands of years, of course, until they evolved to the point where they began to settle and farm. And we, of course, would interpret that evidence differently. First of all, their dating techniques have erroneous assumptions. They weren't nomadic for thousands of years, but possibly hundreds of years. But yes, we would agree with the evidence that humans were nomadic during that period. Why? Well, after Babel, they're spreading out and filling the earth as God told them to, and so they were nomads. It wasn't that they weren't intelligent enough to farm or hadn't evolved enough yet. It's that they were spreading out, filling the earth, Genesis 9-1. During that period, as they were traveling, we might expect evidences of more simple tools and weapons because humans had, had to carry their possessions from place to place. And since they didn't have a lot of time to stay put and design fancier tools and possessions, since virtually all technology from the pre-flood period would have been destroyed in the flood, only the technology that Noah and his sons knew about would have continued after the flood. Humans had to start fresh in designing and, and inventing. So initially their weapons and tools would have probably been light and simple to transport. So we probably wouldn't expect evidences of larger weapons or heavy armor. Since they weren't staying put for very long, we wouldn't expect evidence of cities or even houses. Instead, we'd find evidence, for example, that they would stay in tents or caves. Sure enough, cavemen are associated with the Paleolithic period of the Stone Age. People were finding shelter in caves, again, not because they weren't as intelligent, but because they didn't have time to put down roots. A good comparison might be what the Europeans found among the Native Americans when they first encountered them a few hundred years ago. But after a few hundred years, when they were spread out and began to get settled, different types of archaeological artifacts began surfacing. As more products are being developed by humans that would be useful in a more farming culture and in a culture that stays put, what archaeologists call the Bronze Age. It's during that time that we start finding evidence of human writing. Could humans write before that during the dispersion period? Well, possibly. We'd expect that they were certainly intellectually capable of it, but there simply may not have been much of a need for it. Again, a good comparison might be the Native Americans of North America who were not writing when the Europeans encountered them. They would draw pictures, but they weren't writing, not because they lacked the intelligence to write, but because they had no interest or need for developing written languages. Keep in mind that although God miraculously made new languages at Babel, humans may have had to develop the written forms of those languages. Well, as we wrap up, consider once again the flood. Jesus called the attention of his audience back to the flood in Matthew 24. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all the way, all the way so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Is it important to study the works of the Lord like the flood? Definitely. It's crucial that humanity uh, does not forget the significance of the flood. The flood is a physical depiction of how God feels about sin. When we see a high mountain, we mustn't forget why that mountain exists. The flood is a reminder about God's holiness and the necessity of human repentance in order to be pleasing to God. It's a reminder that judgment can always be just around the corner when we least expect it. But it's also a reminder that those who, like Noah, obey God can be saved through water, just like Noah was, and receive the benefits of God's grace. 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21 once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There's also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ.